website. There's a wealth of information there. On the left-hand column is a green tab with all the subcommittees. There's even more information on each of those uh, those links there. So if you, each committee is only going to speak for five minutes, there is not, they are not going to be able to cover everything they want to. So for more information, please go to that website. Um, on that main website, you will see the first report of this committee. It is an intro report. Don't take anything in there as gospel. It's just where we are as of that moment. We've already gotten some corrections and more information. There will be another report that has updated information. That was just a status of where we are to our, our um, stakeholders, basically our power people, Ross, Sheila, the other uh, the mayor, and the uh, council members. Um, we do have this facility until 10 o'clock, not 9, so we will try to extend for 9 cents if necessary. Uh, reviewing the format, after I stop talking, we're going to have a welcome by the mayor. We're then going to have a uh, background by David Jarrell, the uh, director of public works. Then we're going to have reports by the subcommittees, uh, who are the subcommittee chairs are in front of you, to my left and right. Then as the presentations are going on, you'll have note cards available. There's note cards and pens there. Write your questions, not testimony, questions on the note cards, and you can pass them up to me. When the presentations are done, I'm going to, as the presentations are going on, I'm going to try to keep those uh, note cards organized and try to uh, tackle as many of the questions as possible that we can. I'm going to give us a cutoff because we have a lot of people that want to speak and give testimony tonight. So those are going to be the three phases, presentations, answering questions that you're going to give me during the, the once the presentations are over that you're going to write during the presentations, and then we're going to take testimony. These guys are going to be limited five minutes each. Testimony, we're going to limit to three minutes each to try to give everybody that wants a chance to speak. If we run out of people who want to speak and we have time, if people want to come back up, we'll move to that. All right, I think those are all the preliminaries. Uh, so with that said, uh, we're going to move. Uh, uh, on the agenda was the approval of minutes, but we don't have those prepared, so we're skipping that. And that, that was all my introductions. All right, with that, introduce uh, Mayor Kevin Butler. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Okay, great. Thank you. So first of all, I want to thank the, um, the task force uh, committee here. Thank you for all your hard work. We, we really appreciate all the time that you're giving to this, all the thought that's going into uh, your efforts here. So thank you so much. I want to thank all the people that have shown up today. You're all here because you love your city, you care about your city. So thank you. Um, whatever side of the fence you're on, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Um, so good evening and thank you everyone for coming out to engage in this discussion. I strongly support and encourage you to say yes to the land swap. I know that change is hard. Envisioning your community in a way that is different from the way you know it is not an easy thing. I'm asking you to keep an open mind because we are attempting to move our city forward and meet the demands of the city as it will be in another 10, 20 or even 50 years. We are trying to direct change so that it can have a positive impact on all of our neighbourhoods and all of our wards. Do you know that when the community of Kingsport was being deliberated, neighbours in Child's Point and Bywater were furious. 
In fact, Kingsport was significantly modified from the original plans to accommodate the concerns of neighbouring residents. And now Kingsport, Annapolis Walk and Bywater came together just one week ago to cut the ribbon and celebrate a new community centre and playground. Oldham Finlayson's intent to create a team of professionals on this task force was laudable. But it is also important to listen to the voices of people who live closest to this proposed facility. We need to hear from stakeholders with the closest vantage point to both sides. I would urge the task force to add those views. I know many people from Newtown 20, Homes on the Glen and Woodside Garden support this project. I know Heritage Baptist and the new developers of the MAFE building support this swap. Because over the past year, I've spent a lot of time meeting with residents and business owners to explain the goals of connecting the city. With all groups, from the environmental organisations to businesses to immediate neighbours, we have found overwhelming support. Many are here tonight and have written letters. Before they speak, I want to re reiterate some of the benefits of this proposal. To start, the most out valuable asset in the city of Annapolis is the people. It is a priority of my administration to allow people from all wards of our city to experience the amazing assets of the city that the city of Annapolis can offer. Being in interconnected is one of the ways we can ensure the enjoyment of these amenities. Tapping into the resources swaps, the swap opens up is a key component. You will see in the finance report that the move makes financial sense. The relocation of DPW off of Spar Road isn't a new idea. It was championed by previous administrations and was an idea embraced by the late Speaker of the House, Mike Bush. The Department of Public Works facility on Spa Road has been there for decades. It is not ideal in its current state for our workers and that is why I have been moving with all deliberate speed to make progress on this plan. So that everyone is aware, <coughs> DPW workers and their union previously considered the old capital site to move to on Gibraltar Avenue. This parcel is no longer available to the city and that is why we've had to scout, scout new locations. There are no differences in efficiencies in working on DPW on Spa Road or Forest Drive. Workers can serve the community for fleet maintenance and snow removal and other activities equally well at both locations. I know that workers are frustrated and we will work to improve the temporary facilities, but I urge an open mind to permanently relocating DPW. Your community is along Forest Drive. This change is useful because the connection brings opportunity. We know this swap will bring matching grants for new synergy amenities into play. For these grants, we need cash as the match. The swap gives us starting capital to enter into grant opportunities. Housing along the Spa Road corridor is not only a better use of that property, but also a long-term addition to our tax base, further strengthening the city's finances. As we mentioned at one of the task force meetings, DPW is a good neighbour. Don't be afraid of having DPW in your community. In the area where it currently sits, even in its dilapidated state, the neighbours have seen home values raise at the rate equal to other neighbourhoods. Imagine what a good neighbour it will be with a sleek, new LED certified building with the additional community amenities we can afford to acquire alongside the new structure. The face of Annapolis is ever changing. If it wasn't, there would still be a large oil tank and gas uh, oil tank and gas stations at City Dock. You get from one place to another within the city limits on a horseback. Change is difficult. I'm asking you to think about the long-term benefits of this and to think about your kids and your grandkids. 
weigh them against your short-term concerns. The time is now to make bold decisions about the direction of the city. I urge you to join me in supporting the DPW swap. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is David Jarrell. I'm the Director of Public Works. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, we appreciate your interest in this project. So I'm just going to give a little bit of background on the project, not talk specifically the pros and cons, just a little bit of information about what our requirements are, and then a little bit about each of the sites. Um, I had a, a nice uh, presentation for you all to see, nice pictures, but unfortunately we're still trying to get that working. So some of the operational issues. So uh, as you know, we did a full design for, uh, for the site Spa Road. Uh, we started the construction a couple of years ago, uh, did the demolition, and then stopped at that point. Uh, so we have a full, uh, full design for the east side of Spa Road. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we incorporate into that design uh, for the project. So uh, the main building was going to be 25,000 square feet. Most of that is for uh, the fleet maintenance facility and also includes storage and admin space. Um, we also need 5,000 square feet of conditioned storage for vehicles that need to be stored inside our Vactor truck and some of our other high value trucks that, um, that we don't like to leave out in the cold. Um, 9,000 square feet of unconditioned storage space, so those are basically just, uh, just awnings over top of, uh, for vehicle storage. The functions that would be assigned to uh, that facility include uh, facilities maintenance, fleet maintenance, sewer, stormwater, streets, and water. So all of those divisions will move into the new facility, uh, irrespective of where it's located. Uh, the project will allow the consolidation of three separate uh, maintenance facilities that we have. We have one at, at the police department, a little maintenance garage there, uh, one at the, uh, the the main fire station on Forest Drive, and then we have the one at Spa Road. So all three of those will be consolidated into one in the new facility. Uh, employees assigned to the facility is 76 currently, and that's going to grow to 81 in the future because we have five additional positions that were added in this last budget cycle. Uh, public works um, facilities and pieces of equipment that will be assigned to the facility and will require parking with 100, 105 pieces of equipment. So that's everything from vector trucks to backhoes to, to light plants to um, you know, small wagons that, that we can uh, use to move things around. Uh, visitor parking is three spaces. We get visitors occasionally out there to pick up trash cans or uh, to do other business there, whether it's vendors or you know, what might. Um, so, so we need three spaces for those. Our normal hours of operation are 6 a.m. to 4.30. Uh, and of course, if there's emergencies, water emergencies, snow emergencies, sewer spills, things like that, we can potentially have to operate around the clock seven days a week. Uh, and all the refueling operations for the entire city, so all uh, police cars, fire trucks, everything in the city uh, goes to Spa Road currently for refueling. Uh, a little bit of information about the Spa Road site. Uh, the east parcel is 8.24 acres. Uh, of that, 2.6 acres is Weems Whaling Playing Field. The west parcel is 3.73 uh, acres. Um, both sides are zoned for residential. Uh, so in order to build a new public works maintenance facility there, we had to go and get a uh, special exception permit uh, from the Board of Appeals. So that was done back in 2017. Um, the capital project that we're talking about at either site is currently funded in the amount of $4.8 million. Uh, we've done investigation of Williams Whalen Field. 
Um, as I guess not totally unexpected, but that is built primarily on incinerator ash. Uh, there's a lot of incinerator ash down there, and then there's a, a fairly thick layer of topsoil on top of it. Um, so we did tests to determine uh, if there were any contaminants, contaminants in that ash. It turns out it's contaminated with heavy metals, which includes arsenic, chromium, lead, copper, and cyanide. Uh, hydrocarbons and semi-volatile organic compounds. So they're not VOCs, but they're called SVOCs. So they're a little less volatile than VOCs, but they are present there. Uh, as I mentioned, a grading permit has been issued for the east side redevelopment and demolitions completed. So to move forward with that site, uh, we would have we have a design builder who designed and started construction. They're still on board, still under contract. So they would have to reprice the project in order to move forward uh, with the project. <coughs> the years. So with that, I'll turn it back over. Uh, now we're going to start with the uh, reports by the subcommittee. Uh, sub subcommittee Chair is going to just change the order slightly. So we're going to start with uh, business, Daryl Hale. Then we go to Don Hankins for city, and Joel. I'm going to bump you up a little earlier for traffic. And then we go to uh, Kathy for community, Jesse for environment, uh, housing. Hopefully, we have Cliff back from a, a county meeting tonight. If not, we'll then go on to uh, city finances with Scott, and then last we'll have land use. And again, hoping Phil is back from a county meeting. So with that, uh, Daryl, you have your choice whether you want to sit here or the podium. Whenever you're more comfortable. With you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Daryl Hale, and I am a member of this task force, and I'm also the chair of the uh, business subcommittee. Um, I was hoping to have a PowerPoint, but I, I just keep going. Okay. Uh, I also want to mention, as a, in addition to being uh, a member of this task force and on the and chair of the business subcommittee, I am also a resident of Ward 4, and I live uh, approximately two blocks away from the proposed site for the Department of Public Works on Forest Drive. Um, as chair of the business subcommittee, I was asked to gauge, engage the business community and get their, their thoughts about um, whether or not they see moving the Department of Public Works as a benefit or detriment, moving it to Forest Drive, whether they see it as a benefit or detriment. That's it, yes. Uh, because of the business community on uh, Forest Drive is, 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 is fairly big, uh, I decided the best way to do that would be to uh, create a survey and send that survey out to uh, the business community. And when I say the business community, I mean any business owner on uh, the South Forest Drive corridor. So I created a survey and I sent it out via email to all the business owners. And I, I wanted to get their response to five very specific questions about this move. So what I want to do now is to go over the survey results with you and, 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 and share that with you. Question number two, what do you see as the greatest benefit to your business by moving the Department of Public Works facility to Forest Drive? And I gave them six options to choose from. Um, the biggest benefit by far seemed to be more job opportunities on Forest Drive, closely followed by um, other. Other, you didn't get to specify what other is, but that's why you're here tonight. You have an opportunity to talk about what your other is. <laughs> Question number three, what do you see as the greatest detriments to your business by moving the Department of Public Works facility to Forest Drive? The, the majority of people said more traffic congestion, followed closely by noise pollution. Then question number four asks, as a business owner, do the benefits of moving the facility outweigh the detriments to you, the business owner? 30, approximately 36% of the people said, uh, chose 
yet, chose yes, the benefits do outweigh the detriments. And then 30, 64% said no, the benefits do not outweigh the detriments of moving the Department of Public Works to Forest Drive. And the last question I asked was, overall, do you recommend that the city proceed with moving the Department of Public Works to Forest Drive? 35% of the people said yes, and 65% of the people said no. What is this? I mean, this is just an indication of where the business community stands. For those people who didn't have an opportunity to participate in the survey, tonight is your night. And for those people who did, questions like other and, and, and other, other questions you may have about this, tonight is also your night. What I'm hoping is to get additional feedback from you about this proposed move. So I want to thank, that's my time. So I want to thank you for coming out, and I want to thank you in advance for sharing your thoughts and, 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 and opinions about this very important project. Thank you very much. So again, while uh, the presentations are going on, feel free to fill out index cards. We put them in the corner right there. We just moved them to be more convenient for you. There's pens as index cards. Add your questions as you're hearing the presentations. We'll collect them, um, and then we'll be prepared when the presentations are over to start answering them. Next up is Don Hankins. He is a uh, city employee and the subcommittee chair for uh, uh, City Plus. Don Hankins, local 34 six president. Um, can you come to the podium, please? Name's Don Hankins, uh, local 3406 president. Uh, Public Works needs a facilities desperately. We've been working in a hodgepodge of facilities for years. We were supposed to be temporarily in the trailers on Spa Road because the building was supposed to be built on Spa Road for approximately one to two years. It's gone on three years plus. The new facility would improve safety, morale, and efficiency of public works operations. We survey, I surveyed the employees that work in public works union and non-union. 100% of the employees surveyed were for staying on Spa Road. Um, they feel that it's a better suited for the operation with size and centralized in the city for operating. Also, every employee that was surveyed does not believe we're gonna see a building because of what's been going on in the past several years. And with the political reasons, they just don't see it. They just think this is a smoke street. This is their opinion. Um, so all I gotta say is, you know, we need a facility. Everybody would love to see a facility. Um, we should give the employees what they need to do their job properly, what they deserve, what they need. And um, I think the employees deserve a lot of credit for working in the conditions they've been working in for several years. And I would like to personally thank them for not complaining as much as they should. <laughs> and I hope that we can come to the conclusion and have a new building, be it point A or point B, but we need a building. Thank you. Traffic slash connectivity slash recreation subcommittee. I've been shorthanding it as traffic, so for, for priority. Good evening. Thanks everybody for uh, coming out and supporting our efforts. Uh, my name is Joel Campbell. I'm the chair of the uh, traffic. Yeah. Connectivity and Recreation Subcommittee. Hopefully there'll be some slides here soon. Uh, I'd like to take a minute and introduce the other members of the committee as well, uh, most of whom are here tonight. Uh, if you guys want to stand up, those of you who are on our subcommittee, uh, Nestor Flores from the uh, County Traffic Department, uh, Tom Baker, Alan Kushner, residents of Ward 4, uh, John Corrin is in the back representing Bike AAA. 
Um, so, and then our other member who's not here tonight is Greg Stewart from the school board. Uh, we've met several times, uh, David, if you could slip forward, that'd be great, um, to identify some of the issues that we wanted to review and try and outline what it is we're, uh, the questions we want to ask and the, the information we're seeking. Uh, stakeholders for us are all the residents, visitors, businesses that are impacted by either an increase or decrease in traffic at both locations based on the swap. Next slide would be great. Uh, also, the communities impacted by the Forest Drive location. Spa Road is uh, quote unquote status quo, so we know the impact on the residents there. Uh, having had the Public Works Department there for a while, we really want to assess the impacts on the move to the Forest Drive. Anne Arundel County is an important stakeholder uh, given that they control Forest Drive. Public Works and other city employees um, are interesting for us. Um, we're still on the stakeholders, if you're aware. Uh, drivers, pedestrians, bicyclists, uh, transit users, anyone using the transportation corridor around Forest Drive in any possible way. And then um, lastly, um, users of the designated sports facilities, uh, both the existing and the planned ones as part of the swap. Some of the issues that we're looking at uh, based on some stakeholder feedback is of the impact on traffic for all modes of, of transportation at each location. So how would that change? Uh, the feasibility and cost of the improvements proposed for the Department of Public Works site. Uh, there are two options for accessing that site. As David mentioned, one is uh, a right in, right turn in, right turn out off of Forest Drive. So if you're heading down the peninsula, you would turn right in and you'd have to exit by turning right out. Uh, the other option is the extension of Skipper Lane behind it, which would then impact traffic uh, on Skipper Lane down to Cherry Grove and out to Forest Drive. Uh, Spa Road, obviously uh, no real road change is necessary. Uh, feasibility of the improvements for the planned recreational facilities. Uh, so there is a, a proposal to enhance some ball fields uh, to make and make them more accessible, uh, which is the next piece, the feasibility of pedestrian bridges, uh, and their connection to the pedestrian bike network that would connect the, the other the side of Forest Drive where the facility is located uh, over to Hilltop Lane and through that beyond into the city to this facility, for example, and beyond. And then also uh, some connectivity uh, on Spa Road, crossing Spa Road, which connect the east and the west sides where there already is a pedestrian bike trail and connect that back to some of the sporting fields. There are other issues, as we identify them, we're sort of addressing them uh, as best we can. The last slide I really have is um, <clears throat> issues that we've identified to date, if you want to slip over, um, and I know this is probably hard to see, but we've broken them down into sort of four categories, traffic, recreation, connectivity, and safety. And so we've requested some data. If you go to the website, you'll see a lot of the questions that we asked and some of the answers that we received from the city. Um, things like training, all the issues around the improvements to the fields and whether or not there is sufficient opportunity to make them more accessible. On the um, connectivity side, uh, we've had a look at the transit plan to figure out uh, uh, if there's going to be additional support by public transportation in the area. Uh, the sidewalks, shared use paths, pedestrian bridges, uh, community access, and um, uh, the pedestrian and bike paths and how they would connect to other destinations. So if there is a bridge that is put over a pedestrian bicycle bridge over the road, uh, how will it impact the, uh, the connection trails that are there? What trails will it connect to? And then lastly, safety, look at a crash data along the corridor and then uh, non-bridge pedestrian bike traffic as well as other vehicular traffic. So we welcome your input. Um, we're here to answer any questions. You can always email me. My name and email address is on the website as well. And as mentioned, our subcommittee members are here and be happy to talk to you or answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. questions up front. I don't know that we'll be able to answer everything. Just, I don't know that we'll have the answer in this room, but we'll collect the questions. If we can't answer them, we'll report back later. Next up is uh, Kathy uh, Ebner for the uh, Community Subcommittee. Okay. Uh, 
Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kathy Ebner, and I'm chairing the community subcommittee. And I um, want to take a minute and introduce the other subcommittee members. Um, if you could just raise your hand when I call your name, Minor Carter, Roger Kaiser Ball, Tom Baker, Alan Kushner, and Dan Brooks, and Curtis Jones. The purpose of our uh, subcommittee is to assess the quality of life impacts on the two proposed locations. And the proposal for the relocation of the Forest Drive site includes several proposed community amenities, some of which have been referred to tonight, such as a pedestrian bicycle bridge over Spa Road of Forest Drive, upgrade of the American Legion facility, construction of a new park at Spa Road, and upgrade of some athletic fields. In reviewing the information, um, so far that the subcommittee has received, we have made the determination that there's not enough information with which to conclude whether or not those amenities really are feasible. For, exa for example, in terms of the pedestrian bridges, we asked about the grant funds, um, you know, the source of grant funds. We asked whether or not the county would approve the bridges. We asked whether or not an engineer had taken a look at whether or not the bridges were feasible. Now, the information is still coming in. Um, in fact, some came in at 11 o'clock last night. Um, so it's still coming in. And as that information comes in, uh, the subcommittee will review it and then you know, uh, continue our evaluation. In terms of the um, benefits and detriments of each site, the forest drive location, um, so the subcommittee finds that the benefits of that, of putting the facility on forest drive, is that it would provide for a new housing community on Spa Road that could enhance the property values of the surrounding area. The detriments are as follows. Um, subcommittee found that putting the facility on Forest Drive would negatively impact values of the home and the quality of the um, life of the homeowners that live in close proximity, most notably homes at the Glen residents. Um, for those of you that may not be aware, Homes of the Glen would be directly behind, I mean, we're talking 30 feet from the rear of the public works facility. Some of the homes will be there. And actually, I see a few of the folks that own those homes in this room tonight, so I sure hope that you are able to have a chance to, to speak out. And that surely, you know, is going to impact their lives, right? They're going to have the noise and the light and the comings and the goings, and, um, and, that, and that, that's going to have an effect on them. Uh, to understand fully the context of that concern, um, for those of you who may, may not be aware, Homes of the Glen is a first-time lease purchase community. So those residents have invested considerable time to get to the businesses there and make use of the businesses. In the subcommittee's opinion, having a tall industrial building is architecturally inconsistent with the surrounding forest drive area. And so we view that as a detriment as, as well. And finally, construction of the facility on forest drive will take more time um, than construction on the spa road. And so that extends the time that the public works um, employees are working in a temporary facility. In terms of the spa road site, the benefit to locating the facility or really having it remain on spa road is that um, the construction of the facility can happen more quickly. And the detriment is that it continues the location of an industrial commercial use facility on Spot Road. So. Thank you very much. Before we go on to next, which is uh, Jesse for environment, ask David to come back up. We've got a couple of questions already asking about looking for a map of the uh, two locations, and that was part of the David's presentation. Jesse's going to go for the Environmental Committee, then I'll call him back up and do his slides. Hi, folks. My name is Jesse Iliff. I'm your South River Keeper. I'm chair of the Environmental Subcommittee. Uh, Bill Davidson sitting in the front row is the other member of the Environmental Subcommittee. Um, we had looked at four primary areas to address environmental concerns with the proposed swap. Um, one is stormwater management during and after construction. The other is uh, contamination of soils underneath the
of the facility. Uh, one is that leaving Forest Drive, the Forest Drive site in private ownership will uh, enable it to be developed in some fashion at some point. Um, we expected that whether redevelopment of the public works facility or private home building happens at the Spa Road site, that there would be disturbance to the soils in Weems Whale and Field, which are contaminated with a number of contaminants of concern that Director Gerald mentioned in his opening remarks, um, and that low or wet areas at either site would require mitigation of some kind, um, and that presents challenges with respect to where wetland creation might happen and whether payment of fee in lieu for that sort of remediation would be sufficient. Um, so with those assumptions in mind, uh, we, we felt that the stormwater management, if it is performed well, and if the weather is predictable, and uh, a number of other assumptions are met, that uh, it's somewhat of a wash. Um, there would be more uh, grading done under the swap proposal, but um, that is also just within the confines of the swap proposal. We don't know what might happen at the forest drive parcel if the swap isn't affected. Um, we, uh, Ms. Ebner already addressed some of the environmental justice considerations, but we also considered those very strongly. We noted that uh, there didn't seem to be residents from any of the immediately adjacent communities to the Forest Drive parcel on the task force. Um, I understand that the city has made some outreach in those communities. Um, but we felt that it was important that the folks who would be most directly impacted be able to share their concerns uh, and, and their hopes. What it's gonna look like, next slide. So this is the, uh, the Spa Road site. Uh, so on the right-hand side is the east side that we're talking about where we did the demolition. You can see the demolition site right along Spa Road. Uh, where Williams Wayland Field is, and then the back lot uh, that's part of the project. Um, on the west side is where we're operating out of currently. So that's where the salt dome is and the fleet maintenance garage currently. Next slide. So this is what the, the proposed uh, construction on, on the east side is going to look like. Williams Wayland Field stays in place. Uh, doesn't get disturbed during the project, and then that strip that runs uh, to the south and then back to the east, uh, I guess redeveloped. Spot Creek is, is along the bottom there, running left to right, the green area. Next slide. Next. Next. So this is a proposed, uh, proposed site out on Forest Drive. Um, the, where it says proposed site, those are the three parcels uh, currently uh, that we would be building on. And then you see the strip of land that's between Newtown and the American Legion. That would be the fourth parcel. That's 0.73 acres that would be part of the land swap. Again, right in, right out only is, is right now the, the means of access to the site. Uh, but Skipper Lane uh, starts with Newtown Road and goes, goes to the north. So that potentially would be extended onto this site uh, to provide a driveway in and out the back. And that would also be available for the American Legion, so that would be a big benefit for the American Legion because they're right in, right out only right now. Next slide. Uh, so this is our concept drawing for how uh, the facilities would fit onto the Forest Drive site. Uh, that, that building, the large building that's towards Forest Drive is, is that same building that you saw the, the concept drawing of. And then we have the vehicle storage along the south side, material storage in those uh, units that are numbered one through 10, and then the relocated salt barn in the back. Uh, this shows the access out the back and over to Newtown and across to Skipper, Skipper Lane. I think that's it. Thank you. So we were getting a lot of questions about what the sites look like, so we wanted to circle back to, to show those. So the housing committee is uh, chaired by somebody who is a county employee and had a, had a county obligation tonight. So the housing committee 
The Housing Committee did not have a uh, report in the initial first interim report. If you look on the website, right below it, there's a supplemental first interim report. In there is the housing uh, report and the land use report. So combine those two reports together. Uh, so we don't have housing tonight. Uh, city finances, Scott Gibson. Can somebody pull up our slide deck? Uh, so quickly, while they're doing that, um, Bill Davidson and I worked on the uh, look at finances uh, for this transaction. And we haven't talked about what a land swap is, so I thought I'd level set really quickly. A land swap is no different than the lunch trades you might remember from when you're in grade school, right? Your mom or dad packed the highly coveted sandwich. If you were willing to satisfy your needs at lunch by trading that for a less desirable sandwich, you might have got cookies and chips too. That's what we're looking at with this deal. In Spa Road, we have a highly coveted piece of property. If we're willing to meet our needs with a piece of property that's of less broad appeal, we may get a lot in return. That's the premise of this land swap. And so as we examined whether or not this is a good thing financially, we looked at three questions which I highlight on the next slide. Um, first, you know, is there a net positive fiscal result for the city? Are we going to get a lot in return for meeting our needs with a property of less broad appeal? Um, assuming that we do receive a lot in return, are we going to be able to leverage that to get even more through grants? Um, and then lastly, you know, do those one-time net fiscal proceeds get eaten up over time because there's cost differences in running DPW at a different site? Um, so if we skip ahead, looking at the first question, we can skip ahead one more. At a high level, uh, we know that the land swap results in a $2 million one-time gain to the city. Um, that's $2 million added to the city's bottom line. Um, and I put up here for you in this slide its relation to the appraisals so you can evaluate the reasonableness. I can tell you the appraisals were independent and paid for by the city. Um, but what I would also caution is not contained within this slide is the fact that the developer is willing to take on $500,000 of the remediation cost at Spa Road. That is a liability that the city currently owns as the polluter and owner of that property. Uh, so you could almost tack another $500,000 onto Latera's valuation because it's eating $500,000 of the city's current liability. If we move ahead um, two slides, uh, we get to that grant landscape again. You know, like my colleagues on the committee have said, we're getting more and more information differently or as uh, time goes on. I would say it's not that information's missing. We have the broad strokes of the vision. What we're getting with time is the fine details, um, and that's to be expected if we're engaging the community early in the process. So I'm not overwhelmingly concerned by that. Um, since I actually typed up this slide, I can tell you reasonably these grants do exist. They generally require anywhere from 20 to 50% matching. Um, and so hopefully in our next report, we can go into a little bit more detail there. Uh, if we move ahead again, uh, operational costs, what we know is that operationally, there's going to be very little difference in the cost of these facilities because we're talking about the same operations. Uh, the cost of replacing the underground fuel tanks and pumps is likely a cost on both options. Removing those tanks is a cost that's common to both options. They've outlived their useful life. They're over 30 years old. Um, same is true with the salt barn. The salt barn's outlived its useful life. So even moving that is a cost common to both options and not necessarily associated with the move. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, we're looking at whether or not there are material differences between maintaining the fuel tanks and dispensers on site or going to that third party source buying our fuel through the county. Uh, we do know that we'll shed some environmental compliance costs on an annual basis if we get rid of the fuel pumps. I can tell you every organization I've ever worked at has tried to get out of the business of maintaining fuel tanks. A lot of liability there. Um, and then we're looking at whether or not there are material differences in efficiency based on location. We're going to figure these details out, but because you're engaged early in the process, I don't know everything just yet. Uh, if we move to the next uh, slide, the overall picture. So what we're still working through is, uh, next slide please, is whether the city is better served financially by one side or the other. We've already gotten some information to suggest that property values would be higher for new homes developed on spot roads, so maybe that's a, a benefit to the city's tax rolls. Uh, refining the differences in construction costs and verifying whether or not the bonding arrangement for this project could cover the construction costs at both sites. 
um, whether there are material differences in operating efficiency based on location. Um, again, that fueling operations, are we better uh, providing our own fuel or going through a different arrangement? We'll be looking at a discounted cash flow of the options and looking at the reasonableness of the appraisals, but now that we've at least verified that they were independently paid for, paid for by the city, um, their reasonableness is becoming more clear. If we could move to the next slide, please. Uh, but what we know, high level, so these are the broad brush strokes of this transaction. Keeping DPW at Spa Road, if we don't gain any more information than what we have right now, we know it's trending towards a net negative result. Uh, there will be an opportunity cost of not moving in the seven figure range. Um, I'll, I'll conclude with this since I'm out of time and I had a few more slides, I'm sorry I tried to go fast. Uh, it's important to remember that we're just over six years past the point when the financial bond rating agencies downgraded the city's financial outlook and it took us a while to recover from that. If the city wants to invest in over and above services, it really has very few options other than leveraging its assets for creative financing like this or increasing taxes. And that's why we consider that a financial detriment of staying at Spa Road. Um, I'm happy to stay to go over the rest of the slides um, to talk through what we saw as the benefits of Forest Drive and why it's trending net positive. I also have, a, uh, thanks to a lot of work from Bill, we have a detailed slide outlining those costs so you can see that the two million figure holds up, the net proceeds hold up. Um, so I'll stick around for anybody that has questions. Sorry, I couldn't keep it to the five minutes. So a lot of great questions. Um, I just want to hand out a couple of uh, traffic. So I'm going to ask as I'm handing these out for you guys to return these cards to me at the end of the meetings. Uh, so I want to make sure that we give more thorough answers if we're not able to answer every question today because it's that we won't. Um, I want to also just kind of create some maybe some context. Some of these questions are, this is my stack of questions that are sort of outside the context of the uh, task force. I'm going to save them so they get answered by the uh, administration. The task force was asked specifically to look at detriments and benefits of two sites for the public works task force. So there's a lot that falls outside the bounds of that question. And we really try to limit ourselves to the question that was asked. So we didn't look at other sites, for instance, because that's not what we were asked to do. We didn't look at questions uh, that were common to both. So there's a great question about schools that might be common. I'll ask the, I'm going to get to land use, or the school person isn't here, but we have a school person. So I just want to explain, give that context for why the task force won't be capable of answering a lot of these questions. Um, there was one uh, question about uh, the, the makeup of the committee. The question was, who on the subcommittee was asked to be a part of it from the Homes on the Forest Drive, Homes on the Glen, I think they meant to say, home, Homes on the Glen, Forest Drive. The task force did not assign ourselves, so the task force took the members that was assigned to it from the mayor and the council. The council worked together with the mayor that's sort of outside of our bounds, so I can't personally answer. The task force just, we were assigned, we had a group when we started our work together. That's the best I can do on that answer. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Daryl to answer a question about the business group. Um, you know, someone wrote, uh, with only 23 businesses replying with a plethora of misinformation circulating before the survey, how did you counteract the obvious selection bias problem? Um, I'm not sure what it's obvious, but this was the very first survey I did in the very short time we had to uh, get something out to engage the business community. Um, I think you counteracted by having meetings just like this. Uh, uh, this is our first public hearing. I suspect there'll be several more after this. Um, it will probably be another survey that goes out uh, to get uh, additional information from the business community. Um, that's what I can do. Uh, I'm, I'm just hoping people will speak up. If there's bias in play, gives the opportunity to talk about that bias. Let's get it out on the table and let's let's have a conversation about it. So I think that's the best way to go. Thank you. Uh, who wants to take tackle on the cards I gave you? Jesse, you want to tackle one of the cards, please? Sure. So the question was, given the location of the existing DPW site and its proximity to Spa Creek, why is the stormwater requirement less than that of new construction? 
the reason for that is um, just city law. Uh, the Spot Creek site is has um, more impervious surface, and based on the zoning, it is considered redevelopment. Redevelopment has less stormwater management requirements. The rationale being that we want to incentivize using land that has already been developed to make new structures with rather than directing development towards areas that provide higher ecosystem services. So that's the incentivization there, and that's why there is uh, a lower stormwater requirement, notwithstanding the acknowledged proximity to Spot Creek. Thank you. Uh, Elliot, want to take one? So the, uh, will school districts change due to this project? The actual school districts wouldn't change. They, the district itself stays the same, but the, the school to which the students might attend might be different. Uh, for the uh, elementary school, the high school, of course, is one district, and the high school, and those schools, the same district. But I don't know the answer to the question as to the elementary school. It's a very good question, and we'll get an answer to that. Nothing changes. Uh, Kathy, do you want to take one of your questions? Uh, my question was, why were Spotlight residents considered status quo in regard to keeping it on Spa Road? Perhaps moving would be considered better. And actually, if you recall, we did list one of the benefits to locating it on Forest Drive would be that it would, you know, could increase the property values of the Spa Road area. So we did, we did consider that. I think one of the biggest, when we think about the two locations, you know, keep in mind that the um, public works facility has been on Spa Road for some time. And moving it to Forest Drive is a change. So a lot, you know, a lot of the things that we were considering when we thought about a forest drive is that this is a this is a market change from what is currently there, versus um, you know at, at Spa Road. And you know we did this as a detriment to keeping it on Spa Road that it you know we did note that it continues, you know, the location of an industrial commercial use facility on Spa Road. So it certainly is a detriment. But we but we did note as as a benefit to Spa Road, um, you know, by moving to Forest Drive. Thank you. Um, you sure. Uh, one of our questions is, what is the expected revenue growth to expand a tax base if the existing DPW was to be moved? Uh, and that's one of the areas where I said we have broad brush strokes, but we do not have fine detail yet. Uh, we have heard from the developer that he believes he can command a higher price for a home on Spa Road versus Forest Drive. So tax base is really just a formula. It's going to be the number of units multiplied by their value, multiplied by the tax rate. If we can get more units at Spa Road, if they're of higher value on Spa Road, then it's reasonable to assume the tax base would be higher. That said, that's still a hypothesis at this point. And as I pointed out, that's one of those broad brushstrokes that we need to fill in the fine detail for. Thank you, Joel. Uh, one of the questions was, how will the proposed change the hilltop light traffic pattern be considered following the results of the Forest Drive corridor traffic study. Um, Nestor is probably the best position to answer this, but I can tell you that um, that the three-way intersection at Hilltop and Forest Drive is uh, constantly monitored for traffic flow. Uh, one of the unique things there is there is a dedicated pedestrian crossing now where there is no traffic flowing. Those of you who use that a lot will notice that within the past two years, uh, the right turn off of Hilltop onto Forest was eliminated, and that allowed for this dedicated, if you push the button to cross the crosswalk, when you get your white light to cross, no traffic is moving from either road. Um, what changes that will be impacted by the construction on Forest Drive are something we're trying to assess, and how the increases in traffic would affect the uh, traffic flow and the lighting, not just of uh, hilltop and forest, but also Cherry Grove and forest, uh, uh, Bywater and forest, all the way back to Chinkapin and forest, which are the sort of four congested, uh, typically during rush hour uh, areas on the county uh, road. Is that about right? I do okay? Oh, good. Thanks, Mr. <laughs> Thanks. Um, if you want to circle around to your five, uh, Elliot, if you want to do any others? I think that was the only one. Okay. Uh, actually, I'm going to do a couple. Um, 
Where will new gas pumps be on Forest Drive? There won't be uh, gas pumps on Forest Drive. If the, actually, it's David. Right, there, there wouldn't be gas pumps. So we moved to Forest Drive, there would be not, there would not be. We would buy either from the county, from the state, or just through a commercial contract. So we wouldn't add a, a, a gas station at Forest Drive. Thank you. Um, a couple other questions on the composition of the task force about why certain people were not picked. And again, the task force had nothing to do with who was on. We didn't ask, we didn't seek anybody to you know, take those questions up to the council and mayor. Uh, Jesse, do you have another environment question? Yeah, I have what I really kind of consider a hybrid environment finance question, but it is, did the task force ask for estimated future costs to remediate the current site, both with and without the housing development, consider, considering the soil test results? Uh, so the, I, I can't speak for finance. The environment subcommittee did not ask that exact question, but just before this meeting got started, Scott and I were talking about that exact question. Um, and I'll let him jump in if I'm missing anything, but um, I think that this is one of the finer detail points that he mentioned earlier that we really would, have, would be going too far out on a limb to try and estimate because the nature, extent, and geographic dispersion of concentrated uh, contaminants is not completely well known yet. We know some of what is there and some of the places that it is uh, and some of the concentrations, but for that reason, I think it's hard to estimate future costs. I don't know if you had anything else. Sure. Uh, and I just want to uh, share so that way the person doesn't feel they're missing out on their question. I got asked a similar question about the cost of uh, cleaning up the old fuel site and um, also, if grants were available for remediating that site, why the city hadn't pursued those already and why wait on the future developers. So if we can lump them all in together. Um, you know, as Jesse said, the only thing we know for sure is that the city used that site in a way where it is more than reasonable to assume we were leaking things into the headwaters of one of our most important creeks. You know, it runs right through the heart of our city. What that's going to cost right now is speculation. Uh, if, you know, it can be handled easily through a clay cap. That's an incremental cost to the developer. He's willing to cover up to $500,000 of it. My area of expertise kind of ends on finances and public administration. Uh, my colleague on the Environmental Committee uh, put in, actually it's in our last slide, um, some early estimations of what a worst case scenario might cost. Uh, we don't know. We, are, we do know this though, by the time we figure out what the cost of remediation will be, we will know so much that we will be on the hook either legally, morally, or politically for remediating that. So you could end up with the scenario where spa, we stay at Spa Road, plus we add all the cost of remediation. And perhaps that's part of the reason why the city has never had full knowledge of what it's going to cost to remediate that site. Because once you go on record saying, yes, we own this bad site, and here's how much it's gonna cost to clean up, I don't think we'd want our children playing on a field that's contaminated. Uh, knowing the bend of environmental policy in this state, we would probably want to address it. Um, I, I'm not aware of any grants that are available to cover the cost of remediation. Uh, that was not something we looked at. When we looked at the grants, uh, we were looking at the investment in the transportation infrastructure, specifically the bike and pedestrian transportation infrastructure uh, that the mayor talked about in his early presentation. So I cannot speak. Uh, to grants available for mediation. Um, before we go on, I just want to also set the context for where this meeting fits in on the schedule. So we were asked to, uh, we formed in uh, July. We uh, had our first meeting in July, introduced us to each other, set up in a different task force, and went off and did our work. We had three weeks later, we came back with just initial findings. Our goal at that point is to produce something so that you, the public, could understand what we're being asked to study. So I just want to provide that context for there's a lot of unanswered questions. It's still early in the process, so I just don't I don't want the uh, impression to be given this is at the end and we still have all these questions. We're not done. So we kind of got our initial questions answered or out there that are being worked on. We're getting your additional questions, and then we're going to go back and continue our work. I, I envision doing a second interim report to show where we are at the two-thirds mark, and then we'll continue uh, work and then hopefully get a, uh, a final report 
uh, perhaps in a work session that we present to the council in November. Michael. Well, we have another public meeting like this where we can ask questions. Mm -hmm. There's none scheduled. We were only asked to hold one public hearing, so that's what we did. We wanted it early in the process so we could take advantage of what your ideas. We'll continue to take your input, but it won't be in a public format like this. I know. Mm -hmm. Well, because like I said, we were asked to have a public hearing, we had a public hearing, and we're going to continue our work. Uh, I think we should have another one. I think we should have another one, but, uh, but these guys are volunteers. So this is basically Sheila's committee, <laughs> and they've volunteered and they've given us a lot of time. And so um, if they were willing to do it, of course I would be willing to do it, but it's up to Sheila and it's up to you guys. You know? Well, they just want things up to the task force to yeah. respond to that, and we'll continue. Okay, sure. the first time that we'll take under advisement. We'll, we'll decide. Let them know about the email address. Oh, yes. Uh, the, actually, if you can, if you've got it memorized. Uh, okay. Uh, there's an email yes. set up, pwfacility at annapolis.gov that anybody can send questions to. Yep. And if you forget that, again, if you go to annapolis.gov. pwfacility at annapolis.gov. Okay. And again, that website. The, there's not been any uh, that we have heard from the city or the county uh, any recent traffic studies uh, to help us understand or project on either site either Forest Drive or Spa Road so again we can all be subjective and say you know I sit in traffic every day on Forest Drive and I zip down Spa Road but we don't want to do that we want to try and make it as facts fact-based as we possibly can and in fact if we've come to any conclusion in our committee it's that uh, deal or no deal our deal if the deal does happen uh, one of the very first steps should be to do a traffic study uh, to make sure it is supported Thank you. I believe the mayor has a few questions He's yes so I got a lot thank you. So thank you all this is part of the process we're all here, this is the start of the process. This is where we take input, where we design things, where we come up with a product that suits everybody. So, <laughs> I'll go through a few questions, but do you want to say something? No, I'll wait until you finish. Do you wanna, do you wanna, I'm good, I'm good, okay. thank you. Um, what will be done to the current DPW site? How many homes will be built? Will all the fields be removed? from the Wims Whaling Complex. So the current plan looks at about 40 to 50 homes, um, and then it moves Wims Whaling over, and then it rehabs the Bates field, the field that is under the spotlights, and, uh, and the lower field that has um, experiences, um, a lot of flooding uh, issues there. We hope to raise that and put a, a raised grass field on there with better flooding facilities. The next question is, uh, who designed the new building? They said awful. <laughs> uh, what does the rendering indicate as front side, etc.? Uh, much is missing from this proposal. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to read everybody here. Um, What's the answer? Who? Um, I think it um, was it was designed before I came into office. So um, um, Hammond Wilson. Yeah, yeah. Sub subjective. I like it. So. <laughs> what is the, um, the orientation of the building as it faces Forest Drive? It's not. It's not clear. I'm sorry. That's my question. So it's not clear as to what the or uh, is that the front, the back, the side is facing. The, the, the Rembrandt that you saw was the front. So that would normally be, that would be facing Spot Road or Forest. Right now, under the concept for Forest, we're not sure that that will be how that ends up. It may move further back uh, on the site, or it may stay where it's at. That was just an original concept. But, but, but what you saw in the rendering was the front of the building. There's no door. How did the big trucks get in there? The doors are on the side. <laughs> That's kind of information that's very helpful. So, uh, uh, did the mayor present uh, the land swap to propo proposal to businesses? I talked to businesses. We have someone from Seoul here to speak in favour of it, someone from um, 
the bead shop, someone from the uh, urgent care is in support of it. So I have business owners that are in support. I'm sure there are, are not um, business, uh, maybe there are some business owners that don't support it. I believe this is gonna be something that gets people on that side of the corridor. We believe this will stimulate the com corridor economically and will be something, and we'll put official activity, we'll put users on Forest Drive that will use the Safeway. We all know we're in danger of losing that Safeway. So I think it's very important to have some official activity in that area and some, some, something that puts users there and, and, and m makes that sort of a more of a frequent location. We know the bridge, the MAFE building, the owner of the MAFE building is here. He's orienting the MAFE building to a real tech kind of tenant. So we see tech tenants on their electric scooters coming across the bridge and coming over to the restaurants, the CBS and the Safeway on that side. So that's my opinion. <laughs> so, um, so I'm doing this because I see it done in other cities. Where I see other cities connect their um, communities, create these loops, create things to do on those loops, such as stopping at Maryland Hall or the new library and then getting onto the Poplar Trail. These are all the things that are happening in, in, in cities around the country. There's multimodal transport solutions, it's micro transit. This is an example of some micro transit. Thank you. Um, so, uh, will the bridges be designed to accommodate boats being brought to Eastport and to events like the Annapolis Boat Show? So, absolutely, they will be because we have to build the bridges to standards. So the bridges are not going to be built uh, without considering what the use of forest drive is. We know that, um, uh, that there is a lot of commercial boat stuff down there, so of course the bridges will be built to standards. Uh, the property value impacts. Once Annapolis City Spa road land swaps are available, will greedy developers get their hands on it? Uh, where do these proposed bridges and trails begin and end? So, so one would um, start at the top of Hilltop, um, a grade up to uh, the left, the right side of the Legion, and then it would uh, come down on a slow gradation along Newtown Drive. So that would beautify Newtown Drive. What I'm trying to say is this is a comprehensive plan. Not only will we be beautifying Newtown Drive and connecting Newtown Drive and connecting the shopping center to the other side of the city, but also when we move into Woodside, we'll be building a, um, a, a commercial uh, a community center there, which is an important part. We have got funding online to rebuild Newtown, but if we rebuild Newtown and we don't take care of uh, help Woodside and we don't in invest in that corridor, well, Newtown, it won't work. We need stimulation in that area. And we are planning on building all these things with Section 3 practices. We're planning on making sure that when these developers come in to build things, they have to employ people in the community. This idea comes with jobs. It comes with a pathway to get employment, and it comes with ownership. If you build the place you go to work, if you build the place you live, you will have ownership of that, and that's what we want to do with this. Why choose to have a facility in a residential area? Um, so I, Forest Drive Corridor is, uh, is a commercial corridor. So um, I, I believe there's a balance that can be met. We have to make sure we design it so it doesn't negatively impact the residents behind it. So there will be a road between uh, homes on the Glen. There will be buffering, whatever the neighbors want. If they want to locate the parking in different ways, if they want to put the salt dome in a different area, these are things that can be worked on together. If they want a separation barrier, anything that is sort of ma makes it a better product, we are here today to make sure that that happens and that's why this process should continue, and that's why we should have another public hearing. Thank you. <laughs> Will there be an opportunity for public feedback tonight? Yes, yeah, so once we get done with the questions, we're going to ask for your uh, yeah, these, testimony. These are public questions, Tree. Yeah. No, I have to say yeah, yeah, public yeah, to say something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what will happen to the property on the west side of Spa Road? So uh, when the, I think currently, um, from my understanding, um, if the Spa, if the Public Works building stays where it is, that the west side of Spa Road will be um, used for parks and rec. I'd heard that in the conversation. I don't know. If we did it on Forest Drive, I see that as an opportunity site. We could do a WeWork space there. We could do an REI space. We could 
do a home for non-profits, we could take the salt dome uh, and make it into a kind of little screening room or some ideas. There's a, a lot of opportunity that on that west side that could come out of this product once we move um, Public Works to its new site. <laughs> So if you move Annapolis to the Forest Drive side, how do you plan to muffle the noise from large trucks? Uh, how do you plan to uh, control the air pollution? So we can, if you go to Spa Road, uh, you can see the volume of trucks there. What was described here doesn't look like what I see on Spa Road. There are um, half the amount of vehicles on that area. What I believe the building will do is it will muffle the noise from Forest Drive. So it will protect the neighborhood. That's what I believe. So, and also that we can, we can orient. No, 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 no. That's, no, no. That's, that's not a truck. Yeah, I, questions? I, I'm sorry, I just couldn't hold my feet back. later. <laughs> well, we definitely know that when we redo it, that it will fix the area behind Homes on the Glen where all the water pools and all those sorts of issues, and it will create a new parking lot for, for the Legion and some other things like that. So. What happens if people uh, become sick uh, from the fumes? Uh, okay. So I answered that already. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Sheila? Yeah. Thank you. First of all, thank you. Um, Yes, I created the committee, but let me give you a little bit of background. And it is not Sheila alone, it is the entire city council. During the budget process, in the capital improvement plan, the proposal for the land swap was included. My colleagues and I realized that if we approved the budget as it was written, this land swap would have been automatic. <laughs> you would not have had an opportunity to weigh in at all. This is my ward, okay? Of course, we all share. I mean, I grew up here, the city is my ward. But this is the ward that I represent. And I could not stand by and let this just be approved without any discussion. I had one meeting with the developer before the budget. And so during that budget deliberation, someone put in my ear, why not create a task force? And so that's what I did. I amended the budget to create a task force for six months that would study this issue and the terms detriment and uh, benefit are straight from the English teacher's head. And so and they'll stick forever probably. And so that was the beginning during the budget process. The very next day, the city clerk called and said, and she knows more about all of this than all of us put together. She said, well, you amended the budget, but now you need a resolution to create the committee. So I spent the next couple of weeks getting the wording right that would allow us to create a committee based upon professional knowledge, based upon bringing people together who were the experts in, I think, seven or eight fields that are listed in the resolution. The environment, the finance, the community impact, traffic. All of those things needed to be part of this discussion. And as uh, the mayor said a couple of times, I put this task force together. I sought out people who had professional expertise in these areas. I didn't want the emotional heartstrings at this point. We just need the data. We need accurate information so that we as a city council can make a decision. And so that's where we are. The folks that are here, thank you. They stepped up. Folks sent me resumes, you know, saying these are my skill sets. 
I can help you. And so there was no shortage of people who were willing to volunteer. Did I consider where they lived? Probably not enough, because I've heard many times how many people are from Ward 4, who's missing. That was not deliberate. Again, I was looking totally at the skill set that they would bring so that we could gather the data. And as you heard tonight, this is what they are doing. These folks are not being paid, and I can't imagine the number of hours that they have put in already, because they realize, as you do, because you're here, how very important this decision is. Our mayor has great ideas, and I believe that there's some compromises here. He's not good on compromises, I know that, okay? But I believe there's a way to get to a resolution. But the first step is for us to gather the accurate data about what this will do to our communities. And not just the community on Newtown Drive, because they are extremely important. You know, the story has never been told about the number of vehicles that are going to travel this road every single day. You know, the, the wetlands that are there and the impact that that's going to have on the environment. There are any number of issues that we need to still get to the bottom of. So yeah, I will take the credit for putting this committee together. And I believe, and Jared, and, and I have to give Jared all the props because he said yes when I asked him to do this. And I mean, I'm sure he didn't know what he was getting into. So thank you, Jared. I am forever indebted to you. And he's the taskmaster, as you have seen tonight. OK? Um, but again, um, I don't think this is going to be the only public hearing, but I do believe I've heard from several communities who want me to come in and talk and who want others to come to talk. And I believe that we're all open to do that because we need to get to the facts so we can make a good decision. So I thank you for coming out. Share your questions and look at the website. There's an awful lot of information and more is to come. Thank you. One more question I got. Uh, what happens if this uh, swap, what happens to the swap if the task force finds that the DPW should stay on Spa Road? So it gave me a great chance to answer some context. Once the task force is done, our, uh, our audience is the council and the mayor. So we're not decision makers here. We're trying to collect information as best as possible, organize it, and flush it out as much as possible in a reasonable amount of time, and then give it back to the council. I, having served on the council for five years, I would imagine they're going to ignore the recommendation and go. <laughs> <laughs> and there's about later, but and they will look at what the substance was. Why did we get to those recommendations? And I suspect, if I'm reading the tea leaves, the committees, various subcommittees, will have different um, end outcomes. So one committee might say this is a this swap is a good idea. Another committee is going to say it's not a good idea. And the council and the mayor are going to look at the pros and cons, the detriments and the benefits, and come to their own decision. They're the ones who you elected, not us. So I, I'm fine, completely fine with them ignoring a bottom line recommendation if we even do one. Uh, the recommendation, I think, is kind of the small part. The substance, I think, is the big part that we're trying to provide. So that's the context. So to answer the question, whether, no matter what this report says, task force, swap or no swap, it still goes back to the council for them to decide. If they decide to build a forest drive, then they have a, that part is a procurement process. If they decide to sell Spa Road, it could be in the same transaction or it could be separate. But selling city owned land has to be done by ordinance. So if the decision ends up doing a swap, the next thing along those lines is a city council ordinance that will mean more public hearings and, but they're the ones that had a table, not us. And so they'll have to go through all, you know, have that process, but they'll have hopefully our information at their hand. If the recommendation is against them, the city council does not want to do a swap, it's a, a budget uh, situation they need to. They need to fund or make sure they're continuing funding for the capital project on Spot Road. So hopefully I answered that context. I'd like to move on to testimony. Anyone have any pressing questions that they've received that they're 
anxious to answer right now as opposed to later in written document? All right. So the um, we didn't do a sign-in sheet. Maybe that was my mistake. I have one right over there on this table. Oh, you did. Table. Anyone started yet? Okay. okay. So, it's numbered. All right, it's numbered. All right. <laughs> no one's on the list. So I, um, I'm not sure what the most efficient way. But I'm, Brian's going to take the list for me. And we, I don't need, I don't I prefer not to make anyone stand up waiting to speak. So why don't you raise your hand if you want to speak. Brian's going to try to take your name down in, in an efficient way. And why don't we just have someone, if you want to just start speaking while we're in the future, go, you want to go up to the podium so we can hear your question. And then Brian will continue taking uh, names. I just wanted to get the process started. Yeah, you go, uh, what's that? Yeah, that's a great idea. If you want to start lining up, Brian will take the list over to the line so you can put your name down and then sit back down if the line gets long. But I want to keep this rolling. Uh, Elliot and my timekeeper is going to keep you all to three minutes. I apologize for the rudeness of cutting you off, but I want to hear from as many people as possible. Please. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Susan Reimer, and I live in the Homewood neighborhood, right as it happens on the Poplar Park Trail. This was another project that was subject to the same suspicion and scrutiny as what is being called the Annapolis land swap. There were hearings much like this one, and it was at one of those hearings where I went to express my opposition to the path that I listened and changed my mind. I came to understand that we were not simply paving over natural beauty and providing a thoroughfare for outsiders. We were unifying our neighborhood and connecting it to other neighborhoods. That is the promise of the land swap. Today, my grandchildren play and ride their bikes on that path. We walk to the old library and we will walk to the new library. It is how my husband and my friends get to first Sunday. That is all I ask of you. As I did, as I sat in those meetings long ago, please listen and keep an open mind about the possibilities, true as yet not fully defined, of this project. There are many questions still to be answered, but as a journalist of more than 40 years, I can tell you that they are all answerable. Nothing before this task force is unknowable. Please continue to do your hard work to satisfy the concerns of the community. And to be crass, when thinking about this land swap, think of the money. A couple of million, maybe more, it's a lot to leave on the table. It is only through the judicious sale of resources that towns and cities can generate the revenue needed for community projects, such as those that would be funded with the money from this land swap. Look at the Truxton Pool Project, an amazing community resource that is being paid for by money from the sale of the golf course. And in a changing world of philanthropy, where young, idealistic tech billionaires are pledging to give all their money away, a dynamic grant writer could well double or triple whatever dollars are realized from this deal. The land swap promises to connect so many of our communities to places like the new library, the boys and girls clubs, Maryland Hall, and some new ball fields. It promises to make it easier and safer for school children and pedestrians just as the Poplar Park Trail proposal did years ago. It promises connection. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Loretta Jones. I'm a member of the American Legion Club. And um, my question is this, everybody has this thing about the back road. What if the American Legion decided to build that road back there itself? Would there be an issue or a problem then? This is the question that I have. So you have to understand that that being a member of the American Legion, if we decide to put a road back there, that's our decision. That's our land. We can do that. And we don't have to get permission from homes on the Glen or what the land belongs to us. So if we decide to put that road back there for easy access, to South Cherry Grove, that's our decision. So you all have to keep an open mind about all of this, like the First Lady just came up here and spoke. Keep an open mind about it. The land actually belongs to the American Legion. Hi, 
am Shea Brooks and I'm from Homes of the Glen community. And um, I've heard about just um, the whole uh, situation. But um, also, the only thing that I've really heard about was money, property values going up, financial pieces of this project, creative financing, but not one time have I heard about the environment mm -hmm. and the homes of the Glen people that have to deal with that. We have so many sicknesses taking place. We have children. I know with the environment and the fumes and whatever, all the waste and everything that's going to be there on that plant. I know it's there, so we're transferring one place to another. So those people that are being affected are the families that are living there. Where are our children going to be affected? All the, the, the surrounding communities are going to be affected by it. So I haven't heard about the health part of that. So that's my issue. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Walter Vasquez. I'm uh, an advocate for the Latino community as well as a business owner in the city of Annapolis. Um, going through the whole uh, meeting today, and I think it's very interesting the way the facts are presented. And one thing that I would like to uh, point out is how important for us is to start embracing changes. Coming from a person who left his country in his days, a person who came to a new world with different um, rules, language, culture, changes normally are not well embraced, even though most of the changes are for the better. Because I don't think the city or the people here or people who live in the city want to see this getting worse. I think we are trying, they are trying, what I'm trying to, to grasp today is they want to do this better. They want to present the city to have a better look. They have more opportunity for the kids to be safer. Of course, it will have little downsides like anything else. But I think the intention is genuine. It's great for everybody. And I will ask you to think as change as something positive. And I have very little scheme on the game because I don't live around there. But at the end, but I do business around here, and I do represent the Latino community. But I think the idea is great. The only thing is we can work it out around it. Please try not to take one position. Try to co try to compromise for once in this city. Because I've been coming to every single meeting, and it's this way or no way. Can for once, can we do? something that is good for everybody, and we can give something a little bit, and somebody can take something a little bit. Okay, please, change is always great, and feels for the best. Hello everyone, my name's uh, Brian Oxley. I'm the Vice President of the Heritage um, Community Board, which is in Ward 3, just off of Forest Drive, and uh, between Hilltop Village. So we're kind of not directly in your path of the project that you're uh, reviewing, but uh, I think we have a very, uh, my community has actually reached out to us a little bit in the short period of time that we've had because we just found out about this about, I think, three days ago. So um, so we'd like to have a little bit more uh, engagement with the task force or with people from the city, so we definitely need that. Uh, we have 99 homes in the area. And uh, we have a number of significant concerns, but um, the first one I think we would say is that, thank you for the question or answering the question on school districts. Uh, we'd like to know more about that, and we've had a couple people ask about that, considering uh, people buy their homes and try to do long-term planning for families. We have a lot of young families in our neighborhood, and we'd like to make sure that we have some clarity on that issue. Uh, second issue we have is, Really regarding about the pedestrian traffic, I heard a lot about the development. I heard a lot about um, the new building. I heard a lot about traffic, but I didn't hear anything about the pedestrian bridges. So we'd really like to get a lot more information about that, specifically where the pedestrian bridge would be on Forest Drive um, and where that pedestrian traffic would be um, basically uh, directed and how those pedestrian flows would work because we have a pretty small community. It's actually kind of closed off from uh, the main thoroughfare, so we want to make sure that we're um, clear on what that's going to be. Uh, but finally, I think the big issue is uh, traffic. Uh, the Hilltop Village, and I don't know if anybody from Hilltop Village is here, but I appreciate your input. Um, and down Merriman Path and down South Cherry Grove turns into an overflow. 
And we know about all of the traffic congestion issues on Forest Drive, which um, still haven't gone away. And to note, we're also the same issues a lot of people are bringing up about the Crystal Springs development. So there's a lot of things going on that we seem to be glossing over. So I know you have a limited amount of um, what, your, what your duty of the, of the task force is, but I encourage you to look out at least for a couple of little bit other areas in, in the neighborhood that regarding traffic. Um, we have a lot of issues that we've been trying to um, solve as a community at our board with the county, because the county owns, like somebody mentioned, uh, Stero, or the, the Stero Force Drive. And um, we've had a lot of problems with that. We've also had some issues with traffic calming in our community uh, and getting traffic calming done. So these are major concerns, especially if you're gonna put, I heard, heard, originally heard it was 35 homes, and tonight we hear it's 40 and 50 homes. Um, these are all significant concerns that we'd like to have addressed and we'd really like you to reach out to our um, board and our community. Last, um, I would definitely um, unequivocally support another public forum. And Jared, I encourage you, you've got a lot of people here to just take a vote right now if you want to have it happen. So uh, thank you for your time. And seriously, thank you for your service. I know that you're volunteering for your community. It's very important to me. And I thank you for that. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Chris Delzing, and I live in Murray Hill. Um, and I echo how those comments close. I really do appreciate your service here. I've uh, done my time volunteering, and it's often thankless. So thank you. Um, regardless, I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk about the proposed plan. And I re recognize, of course, it's very much in a development phase, so there's lots to be decided. But I want to start by saying that the comments I'm going to make now do echo some of what I've already presented to city, city council on this, and I'm uh, very much in favor of this as it's developing. As a taxpaying resident, a cyclist, a soccer coach, and a citizen who cares to make sure that the bounty of our city is shared equally with all communities within the jurisdiction, I would support this plan primarily for three reasons. First, as was previously mentioned, it's smart growth. Uh, the Spa Road Gateway into the city has the potential to be a grand entrance in the same way that the Road Boulevard entrance provides grand views of Annapolis. A refurbished sports complex complete with recreation facilities and multi-youth pathways will increase the first impressions and visual appeal of our town for people who visit. As it stands now, this attraction is not, this gateway is not an attraction or frankly even that attractive, and at least not until one starts to get down to the closer to the arts district. Secondly, the trail as proposed is a democratic use of public resources and an opportunity to open them up for broader usage. Too often municipalities build resources that disproportionately benefit the wealthier communities and don't provide pathways for ensuring their use by all. This would start to change that paradigm as the athletic fields are more readily accessed by all via safe corridors such as the proposed bike path. Third, the proposal to leverage the cash from the land swap into federal dollars just makes good business sense. Anyone in this, in this room or beyond who is concerned about their local taxes should see the wisdom in building local resources using federal dollars. In closing, Annapolis is a world-class city with third world soccer fields. I have volunteered as a soccer coach since 2005 and every year for the past few years we've been practicing at the Bates Fields. I recognize that some of that is county property, but not all of it. I literally have played soccer, pickup soccer in Guatemala on fields that look a lot like what we have there. The smart growth proposal before you is a way to improve the quality of life for many of our young athletes while at the same time improving our city for all. All right, so on that note, I will close. Um, and thank you for your time. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I'm John Graham. I'm in the ownership at 1754 Strive. I am delighted to be here tonight because, for once, I'm not the developer in the crosshairs of a controversial project. Uh, but I do have a lot of skin in the game. We have like $22 million invested in our project, and uh, that continues to mount as we uh, retenant the project. I just, a lot of people are going to say a lot of things, and I don't want to repeat them, but I, I just want to mention three things that I thought might be useful for this group. The first thing is, this, this proposal for this swap uh, allows this community to control its own destin destiny on a couple of land pieces. Uh, somebody from the Legion talked about their right to develop, you know, however they want to do it, and that's absolutely true. This 
gives the community the ability to, to do some smart development and actually control what happens. Um, the same with the spa uh, property. Um, the other thing is, regarding the surveys, I did not get a survey. Uh, didn't receive one. And I'm, and I'm, the all I want to say is Safeway, us, the guy that owns the shopping center beside us, we are not, we are business owners. Uh, we are not retail business owners. Um, we are experts, however, in what attracts successful businesses to a location. We are experts. Uh, we know whether Safeway, retail development, uh, business development, office space, we know, we, when we think a lot about traffic impact, recruiting for employment, what brings people in the door to your retail facility. Uh, we've actually reached out to some of the businesses around us to talk about how we can work with them better going forward. This is the first time tonight I heard that Safeway may be on the bubble in that location. I can tell you, if Safeway goes out of business, this is going to be nothing compared to that big monstrosity of empty building across the street. I suggest that we get them involved in this discussion and see what we can do to help them stay in business because you don't want that center to go fallow. The last thing I'll talk about, somebody mentioned environmental. I've dealt with a lot of environmental remediation, monetizing big environmental risks. I can tell you for a fact, and this is not, these, this dollars are really not being talked about here tonight. This is open-ended environmental liability for the city. Where's the mayor? <laughs> I like to pay the least amount of taxes possible, okay, in our properties, because we have to pass those taxes on to the tenants. Open-ended liability, eventually everybody here is going to pay for it if the, if the, I just have one more sentence, if the cost and the regulations and everything that continue to go up in Maryland to remediate go up. If a developer is willing to get in and clean this, pro this property up, that takes the city out of the crosshairs of a lot of expense and open-ended liability. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's kind of horrible to go last because everybody say what you're going to say, but um, I'm a long-term resident of Newtown 20. Sorry, can you start with your name, please? My name is Deontay Wood. Thank you. And uh, like I said, I'm a long-time resident of Newtown 20. And I just want to quick, I have a quick question. If everybody that has a job in here, could you raise your hand? If everybody in here that have a job or a career, could you raise your hand? The reason why I ask that because the opportunities for people that live in Woodside to get a job or Newtown to get a job with the remodeling is important. While I'm a youth program director, one of the things that we teach in my programs is uh, being able to give job opportunities in skill trading fields. Um, another thing is, have you ever been into Newtown, Rymore, Eastport? A lot of the children in these communities ride bikes. So not only is this an uh, opportunity like very huge for the children to be able to communicate, or not communicate, but go to different communities without riding on the main roads. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, seen somebody running across the street on Forest Drive versus actually using a crosswalk that we talk about. Um, and even the youth that I work with, we run to Maryland Hall um, almost every Saturday morning to do a workout. So that bridge will be huge for us to be able to not have a fear of one of the kids falling off the sidewalk or something like that and being hit by a car. Um, and when you speak about the fields that are gonna be remodeled or renewed, I played football at that park for maybe like 10 years. I have bruises and cuts from the rocks that are on that field. So that will be a tremendous improvement for a lot of the people that participate in the after school activities on those fields. And I just want people to be open-minded that we are all a community. And while we are all sitting here debating on what's good and what's not good, um, just think about the communities like Newtown and Woodside and Bywaters because we have limited opportunities. And if you look across the street on Forest, um, the main building, we've actually been, well, I've been working with a lot of uh, local community people to get at youth to go to the actual building while we are at the same time creating STEM programs. 
So when you think of the future and you think of the things that we are able to do with our youth, I mean, this opportunity for the funding could be very huge for the children in these communities. So just be very mindful, not just mindful. And, um, you know, don't think about you, but think about the people that surround the entire community. So thank you. Good evening, my name is Mary Lynn Wilhere. I'm a resident on Carrollton Avenue, which is a little pocket neighborhood of houses right by Maryland Hall. Um, I have a 1957 house. It's a whopping 624 square feet. Um, so I know most people in my neighborhood don't know anything about this. And I actually was running around tonight trying to hand out flyers to get some people here because I know folks don't know about it. Um, we're very concerned about the traffic. Um, with all the recent development of, you know, the, the Bazudo townhouses, uh, you have West, uh, West 141 and then West End Row, and then the Enclave, the traffic on Spa Road has gotten so bad that we can hardly get in and out of our development anymore. And it's actually getting somewhat dangerous to get in and out of our little street there. Um, I'm also concerned about the loss of the green space. Um, I know they're going to improve the fields, which I know they absolutely do need um, improvement. But I can say my living room kind of looks out towards the running track. And those fields are used all the time. They're hugely popular. Um, so I'm a little just concerned that we're going to lose uh, that big area to, to development. Um, just the loss of green space in Annapolis, I think, should always be um, considered carefully. Um, I definitely support a lot of the mayor's initiatives, so I think there's just good, uh, good ideas and a lot of compromise and discussion still <coughs> needs to take place. Um, what a lot of people probably don't know is uh, on Carrollton Avenue, we have a, a very, very dense bird population. Um, in fact, the bird song is so loud on my street, I have to shut the windows to make a phone call. And people come to my house all the time and just say, what is it with the birds on this street? It's just like a din. And it, it really is true. I, I think there's a lot of migratory birds that land in that area. Um, and again, I'm just concerned about any unfair impact on low income um, communities. So my street is considered low to mid income um, street. And I know that many of my residents, I can't speak for all of my neighbors, particularly my neighbors who are African American, but I know they feel like they're being squeezed out of uh, downtown Annapolis um, by luxury housing. And if you look at the housing that's going in, it's pretty dense. Um, I would call luxury housing, at least on my salary. Um, so, and I also heard a rumor that there was going to be a 10 to 20 foot wall dividing the neighborhood in our neighborhood. And I was like, I, was like, I hope that's not true. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Tatiana Klein. Um, I wear many hats. One of them is I'm a watershed steward. And also, I'm an educator, and I educate private and public school students. Um, one of my biggest passions is also after uh, school um, children of low income. Um, so I want to talk about there's a lot of things and a lot of things that need to be clarified um, that I don't think is necessary to do here. If you're interested, you will look more into it. But one of the things that I want to um, open up is the vision. And the vision is to actually create a community or an Annapolis community where people can communicate better without the use of automobiles. And um, so Annapolis is a wonderful, wonderful city, and some people really walk and bike. But it is not safe. My husband got hit once, and forest drive is very difficult to drive. And there's a lot of people that use biking to work, not just because it's fun. It's because it is work. And also, I'm very big on safe paths for kids to go to school. If you go right now into Spa Road, the going into Bates. It's not a very safe area. At night, the kids are walking by themselves. It's very, actually, ugly looking. So I think that supporting the development within a critical area, which as a watershed store, I expect that a critical area will have a lot of regulations on the development, and perhaps even improving that 500,000 
issue with the land. Uh, we'll benefit the walking path for the kids. We'll actually improve more walking for people. And it's also us start changing the mentality that we need to take a car and drive for everything. So if actually the city provides areas for walking and biking, I assure you more people will take that advantage. I will be one and I love biking, but you know, biking from where I have to go to the where place I work would be really very risky. So um, that's one of the things. The other thing that I just wanted to, to say is that um, I care for Newtown also. And uh, yes, it may be, actually I don't think there is so much traffic right now in the in the spa with the public works as it is because every time I go I don't I don't feel like the public works itself is creating more traffic. So I don't think we have we have to speculate right now about if it's going to more traffic or not until we really have a study. And with that said, I will say yes, maybe there's a little compromise of the neighborhood behind, but the benefits on the really, really poor um, areas around it, like Newtown, and even in Ward 4, which I worked a little bit, there is a lot of kids in need. Uh, there is a lot of things there that are not going right with drugs and gangs. So if we can create a better environment there for the kids to have jobs, to communicate better with other places, we probably can improve those areas too. And as I say, Safeway and all those areas also will be a benefit. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Scott Shelton. I'm the pastor of Heritage Baptist Church, um, which is the nine acres between South Cherry Grove and Hilltop Lane. We own that whole stretch of property. We've been there since 1969, 1970. Um, there, removed from downtown back in the day. Um, I will say this, just the very beginning of this, this has been a, a, just like my addition to this. I've really appreciate everyone's comments and all the work and all those things. Um, but probably the thing that most like kind of captures my imagination, my attention, is this idea of connectivity, um, both from a pedestrian end, from the biking end. Um, I see this as a tremendous um, opportunity, potentially for Annapolis to set a tone um, for other areas and other communities. Um, we, we serve between 80 and 100 plus families every single month in our food bank. And so we see this traffic flow, like this pedestrian traffic flow. I saw today um, a family of about five people, two um, um, moms had strollers and small children with them. And then in addition to the three or four bags of food that we're getting, it, it, it's a problem. It, it, it was so much so that my only question to the mayor when they came and met with us was, how far are you pushing that bridge over? Are people gonna actually use it? You know, how far over to Hilltop? And the fact that it's landing on Newtown Drive, to me, is, is perfect. And so um, we, quite literally in our day and age, can build bridges to each other. And that, to me, is um, wonderful. And obviously, it would, it would have to land on our property at some level. So there's this ongoing conversation internally with us is public-private partnership. Um, I will say this, I've had two meetings with the mayor. I've also reached out to Jared, who gave me his time. Um, I, I, in addition to that, I also um, reached out to Daryl, who called me within 30 minutes of that. And so I would just encourage you to reach out and to get questions that you might have answered. Um, and uh, um, so all that said, a lot of it's like, with all that you know, do you support this measure? With all that I know, I would say we support this measure because um, we want to help Annapolis connect and we want to serve the greater good and the greater Annapolis good. And, um, and that takes all of us. And, um, and so anyway, thank you for your time. So uh, this is kind of off subject. Let's finish down here. Oh, oh, sorry. I, was just I just wanted to know if uh, anybody in this room would love to become a mentor to a lot of the youth. Um, if so, you can meet me in the back and I got pen and paper. <laughs> Hi guys, 
guys. Um, I'm Jennifer Balducci, and I'm president of SOFO. And for you that don't know what SOFO is, it's South Forest Drive Business Association. So I'm just speaking directly um, uh, as the comments that were made earlier about the businesses on Forest Drive. I wanted to make sure that we were um, represented. Um, when the survey came out, um, I'm disappointed that it was such a low uh, response rate. But um, busy business owners, unfortunately, sometimes things get in the cracks. Um, I think what the survey didn't, the, the questions on the survey asked kind of, it was almost like a little bit of a, a negative spin. Like, you know, here are the things that we're looking at and is that gonna impact traffic? Um, instead saying, well, if we don't put something like public works on that forest drive, well, what is going to be developed there? Mm -hmm. And I really just want to reiterate that if we have control over the development that happens, that's way better than if you're just putting another 3,000 units um, in a space, which we don't need any more housing on forest drive. I think everybody can agree with that, that the traffic is horrendous. We all know it is. And so the least amount of impact that we can have on forest drive, I think, would be um, supportive by all the businesses um, and along with that um, we also want it to be attractive forest drive is an ugly corridor I think everybody can agree to that it's been neglected since I've lived here for 17 years and way before that and I think we need to make it look more appealing and look you know better for people that are coming in through the city that's the gateway to the maritime industry there's so much history there um, cars beach none of that is represented by what we see today um, we need more trees um, not less and so if we put a building up we can say we'd like to have some more trees in front of it instead of just looking at an ugly building. Um, we definitely also want connectivity. Um, right now, there's literally no sidewalk from Forest Drive to Spa. So you have a whole huge stretch where there's no sidewalks. So not even talking about pedestrian bridges, which are a little lofty. I sat in on the, uh, the Forest Drive sector study, and we brought up pedestrian bridge bridges, and they were kind of poo-pooed by um, planning and zoning, saying that they're not really, I don't know what the, the actual chances of that getting done. But, um, but definitely we need, at, least, at the very least, sidewalks to connect one part of Annapolis to another, um, and to keep it you know, better looking than what it is right now. Um, uh, I feel like, you know, again, thank you guys so much for your time. I know you're all volunteers. I know Jared definitely knew what he was getting into. Um, but, you know, this is a huge undertaking, and I don't envy your position, but thank you guys so much for that. So, thank you all. Thank you. ready to speak, I'd like to give the uh, chairs a chance to respond if they have any comments or closing comments before we move on. Uh, Daryl, would you like to start? Uh, sure. Um, again, uh, thank you everyone for coming out and, and sharing your, your thoughts and opinions about this project. I do want to say, um, when I was asked to chair the business sub, uh, subcommittee and come up with some, a survey just made sense to me. Uh, I'm not an expert in doing surveys, but I, I was limited to benefits and detriments, benefits and detriments. So I tried to design a survey that got at benefits and detriments. Um, I did talk to Ms. Balucci, who was the, who the uh, president of SOFO. I, I, I got the list there for SOFO. I walked around, knocked on doors, I called people, I went to Safeway, I went to CVS. Uh, I agree there were limitations to that. But I always thought that this was the first survey of many. And I've always thought this was the first conversation of many. Honestly, I believe you have to be collaborative, you have to be inclusive in order for this to work for everyone. So uh, I welcome the feedback. I welcome opportunities to improve on, on the data. I welcome anyone who wants to work with me to, to design better survey questions. I welcome to talk to anybody who says, hey, I didn't get a survey, how can I get one? Because I think your, your, your thoughts, your feelings, your opinions, the impact of this does matter. And I'm open to that, so thank you. I like to get
I just think it's amazing. I want to be with the mayor say when he first started that it's pretty cool that you guys want to come out and talk about a land swap. <laughs> pretty impressive. And I will get back and put on the post on the website the information on the schools that was asked for earlier. Jesse, any closing comments? Um, I just wanted a chance to briefly address a question that I didn't get a chance to answer earlier, which was what is the chances of using Superfund money to remediate uh, the Weems Whalen contamination? And the quick answer is, I don't know. Uh, the real answer is much longer, and the city will have to talk to a Superfund lawyer to really get a fair assessment of that. Um, but there are hazardous substances at play, so it's possible. Uh, but beyond that, um, I echo the other task force members and thank you for coming out, and I hope that you'll continue to feed us more information and put us in touch with more data for our consideration as we go forward. Thank you. I just uh, want to reiterate that we'll get those remaining slides, which really present the facts and figures, up on the website, um, and we'll commit to continuing to provide the facts and figures in an easy-to-digest way um, as we prepare a second interim report, perhaps, and a final report. Um, for public associations or community associations that are interested, I'm happy to engage with you at your meetings if you have questions about the finances. I'm the president of a community association, so I know what it's like for people uh, to want to talk about that. I just have to balance it with my real boss. We've only been married a year, and I'd like to keep it happy. <laughs> so uh, my email is on the website. I actually think I put all my personal contact information on the website, so please feel free to reach out, um, and I'll do my best to, to engage with your community organization uh, to go over the finances and how a transaction like this works. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think, you know, I was taking notes from the public comment, and thank you for everybody that spoke, because I think that's really important. Um, and it's clear that, you know, these additional amenities, like it was mentioned several times about the bridges and several times about the park, I think it's just so critical and so important that we get to the need of that and we understand um, and confirm what's possible. Because, um, you know, I think, I think the question I think a lot of people have to ask is, if the pedestrian bridges are not possible, would you be in favor of it? Okay, I think that's really an important question. And I've had that conversation with the mayor. Um, and I think, you know, that, it's, that the pedestrian bridges are critical to this entire idea. And so for that reason, I think it's just crucial that we really be able to nail that down and get to the heart of that um, and do the due diligence, do the hard work so that we really can answer that question. Um, and also, we really, the community subcommittee wants to have as many um, neighborhoods represented um, as, as possible. Um, and so what we'd like to do is, um, please, if, if you or a representative of your neighborhood wants to participate in the community subcommittee, we'd love to have you do that. My contact information is on the website. And what we um, have talked about is after this, is um, getting together to digest what we heard and then hopefully being able to gain some more input from, you know, from everybody. So thank you for coming out. We appreciate your feedback and input. Uh, I would also thank everybody for coming out and uh, participating in um, democracy. Uh, the, 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 per the point that I made earlier is sort of the point I want to leave you with, that we're looking for facts, um, not sort of gut feelings, not opinions, not subjective judgments, but as much factual data as we can get. There are many questions about traffic studies and corridor studies, and if anybody knows of such and can point us to them, we'd love to have them. Um, my, my email is on the website. Uh, we're happy to take any sort of relevant data that we can use to try and make a fact-based discussion uh, of what the impacts are going to be on traffic and connectivity and, and recreation. And as Kathy said, you know, there, there are things that we're trying to assess the feasibility. Is it, is it feasible to build the pedestrian bridges that are described and proposed? Uh, even leveraging the money that's available, that sort of $2 million seems like a lot of money until you start carving it up. And we want to be able to work with everybody on the task force to figure out how much you can carve that pumpkin before it's pumpkin pie uh, and no longer suitable for what you were trying to do. So um, I would encourage you to keep uh, providing information, to keep asking questions, uh, to talk to your council folks. Uh, at the end of the day, 
we're just fact gatherers and reporters. Uh, the people that are going to make the decision are the people that you've elected to serve you. And uh, you should continue to engage with them at every opportunity because beyond our report, I'm certain, as Jared indicated, there will be multiple additional public hearings as it moves forward in any context. And uh, everyone should stay engaged accordingly. <clears throat> With that, I want to thank, uh, first, I want to thank Sheila and uh, Gavin for appointing me this, to this chair. <laughs> uh, I also really want to thank the committee members. We've got roughly 20 people, and you, and you can see they put in a ton of time, not just the chairs, but the uh, people in the seats in front, you know, for, front row and a few that aren't here that are listed. Everyone's been putting in a lot of time. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming out. My email is also on the website. I'm easy to find uh, in person as well. Uh, feel free to continue to reach out. Uh, we're doing our best uh, and we're out of time for one second. As for next steps, uh, currently we have three meetings uh, scheduled. I think the task force will regroup a little bit and uh, we'll have some internal discussions. Uh, consider the uh, request made by multiple people about having a public hearing. And uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll discuss internally about best steps forward. I try to be uh, open-minded and uh, uh, take advice from the task force members and we'll come up to a uh, decision. Um, you want to ask? Yeah, I just have one question. They were talking about the bridge that's going to go over Farshire. Will this bridge be high enough so where tractor trailers can go under? With a boat show come in town, the boats that have to come down far down, will it be tall enough for the boats to go through so it won't be any damage or a tractor trailer gets stuck up in there? Uh, great, the yeah, great question. I think that we heard earlier that there are certain uh, bridge standards. Anything constructed like that would have to meet those standards, which would include consideration of those issues that you pointed out. The existing lights meet those standards as well. What's that? The existing lights that go across the border meet those standards. Okay. I would imagine the bridge is pretty high. That would make sense. I'm not a bridge expert. I'm an engineer, but I'm not a bridge expert. I'm sorry. <laughs>